What's up, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast presented by Boot Crew Media and Level Water. Level Water is a New Orleans-based bottled water company providing a sustainable, reliable brand of water that relates to this generation and its ever-growing health-conscious lifestyles. Make sure to go check them out at levelwaterco.com or on Instagram at levelwaterco. That's levelwaterco on Instagram. Go check them out. They have great stuff there. And this is going to be a fun episode for you Saints fans out there. We have a lot to talk about. But before I get into all the Saints stuff, and, I, and we have some fun topics, some engaging topics, I should say. But the first thing I really want to address is something that's been talked about almost on every sports show lately, and it has to do with Julian Edelman. So Julian Edelman retires on Monday, and obviously you wish him well, great career, and there's no shame in that. But then there's always the people who try to get a little ridiculous. And what I mean by that is everyone says, hey, is Julian Edelman a Hall of Famer? Does he deserve to go to Canton? And I want to know what world does Julian Edelman get into the Hall of Fame? And, and I know that he's, you know, had a lot of success with the Patriots and everyone's going to bring up the three Super Bowls and the Super Bowl MVP. And that's great. And no one can take away from that. But that is team success with the added caveat of the Super Bowl MVP. So I'll give him that. But I'm going to give you three wide receivers. I'm going to lay out their stats and you're going to tell me who has the most Hall of Fame worthy resume. And I'm going to put a disclaimer in here. I don't think any of these three wide receivers are Hall of Fame caliber. I just think it's funny to make these comparisons. So let's start off with the first guy. The first guy, 711 receptions for 9,759 yards and 72 touchdowns. That's the first one. Over 700 receptions, almost 10,000 receiving yards and 72 touchdowns. The second guy I'm going to list. 514 receptions for 6,835 yards and 49 touchdowns. Nothing too special, but nothing bad at all. You know, not nothing to write home about, but obviously that's not too shabby in the NFL. So 6,835 yards, 49 touchdowns. The third guy, 620 receptions, 6,822 yards. So 6,822 yards off 620 receptions and 36 touchdowns. So, You're wondering who are the three guys I listed. So the first one I listed, which was almost 10,000 receiving yards, that's your boy, Marcus Colston, who we all love the quiet storm and what he was able to do in New Orleans. The the third guy on the list, so at the bottom in receiving yards and touchdowns, was Julian Edelman. So you're wondering, who did you pick to prove your point that Edelman's career wasn't as special as people think it is in terms of individual production? And again, I'm not here to just rip Julian Edelman. I'm just here to show how ridiculous some people are and and they're way too in the moment and recency bias takes over. The second guy I mentioned was Jeremy Macklin. You cannot find a player, a person on this earth that will say, hey, you know what I think is a Hall of Famer? Jeremy Macklin. No one says that because Jeremy Macklin is indeed not a Hall of Famer. Just like Julian Edelman is not a Hall of Famer. Just like Marcus Colson, who I love dearly, He's not a Hall of Famer. Now, he should have made a damn Pro Bowl. I don't know how the hell that never happened, but he's not a Hall of Famer. And that just goes to the point. Team success does not equal Hall of Fame. I know that's something that people want to talk about a lot. And I love Julian Edelman's play. He's tough. He can block. He's a great receiver. Tough catches over the middle of the field. The Patriots don't get to where they were in certain regards without him. But he's not a Hall of Famer. Because then we're changing the standard and what is the criteria for Hall of Fame. For example, Drew Brees. That's a Hall of Famer. Larry Fitzgerald, that's a Hall of Famer. Even today, someone brought him up, Chad Johnson. I'm sorry, Chad Johnson is light years ahead of um, Julian Edelman. And I don't even know if Chad Johnson really is considered in many people's eyes a first bout Hall of Famer. And, and, and that's a guy who, when you put, put in the tape, you watch him play, obviously better than Julian. So I'm not here to just, you know, rain on his parade. But let's be a little real here. Let's be a little realistic. You can congratulate someone without going a little bit over the top, you know. I, I think that's fair. So let's get into some Saints talk. And before I get into the, the meat and potatoes, I want to say this show because there's some NFL draft prospects we're going to hammer home. I want to talk about something that I found fascinating, and you guys found it fascinating too. And it came out this week that Kevin James is going to portray Sean Payton in an upcoming Netflix movie titled Home Team. And it's going to be produced by Adam Sandler's Happy Madison production. So obviously, this is going to have a comedic spin on it. This movie is going to be based on how Payton wound up serving as assistant coach for his son Connor's sixth grade football team during the year that he was suspended because of Bounty Gate. So comedic spin, Bounty Gate year, a lot of fun stuff that we could do here. I just don't understand if there was a movie and this all came into fruition, like how Kevin James was the guy. Now, it makes more sense now that you know who's producing it because Adam Sandler and Kevin James are pretty close and, and they have close ties there. So that makes sense. And, and 
when you look at the movies that guy makes, I mean, he will go through the same guys. You want David Spade, you want Kevin James, you want Chris Rock. Uh, who do you want? You want Rob Schneider? That's basically the rotation for Adam Sandler movies. And I still love them anyway. But when I saw this and I didn't read the details at first, I just saw Kevin James is playing Sean Payton. I was like, what in the hell am I reading? And then I look back at the clock and, and the time and the calendar. I'm like, all right, it's like April 12th. This, we're not throwing out April Fool's jokes on April 12th. That's not how this game works. Lo and behold, it actually is real. So Netflix movie, Sean Payton, it's going to have a comedic twist apparently. I'll tell you this. If we get some Roger Goodell jokes in there and we get Kevin James on his little segue looking like mall cop slash Sean Payton, I guess I'll take it. I'll watch it anyway. I'll tell you that much. I mean, there's not much on right now ever since COVID. So I'll definitely watch this. But when I saw it, I was like, there's so many people I can see playing Sean Payne in a movie. And I never once saw Kevin James. Doesn't mean I don't like Kevin James. I think the guy's hilarious and, and very entertaining. I just didn't see him as the Sean Payton character in a movie. But we have surprises. And that one for me was a big surprise. So I'm interested. Do you guys like kind of want to see it? I'm going to watch it, man. I watched, I think it was called Hubie Halloween. It was a Netflix movie with Adam Sandler. So I will watch this. I hope it's good. Can't be much worse than the second mall cop movie. Hopefully they do Sean's character justice. So that should be funny to see. Now let's get into some actual Saints talk. Enough of that Kevin James stuff. Let's talk about the MVP odds that are in for Jameis Winston and Alvin Kamara. And you're probably sitting at home going, why are there even MVP odds on Jameis Winston? But frankly, I look through the odds. There's MVP odds on a lot of guys that I would never bet on. Like, for example, Trey Lance, who I think is going to be a good rookie. I'm not betting on his MVP odds, but they're out there and we don't even know what team he's on yet. So can't really complain about Jameis getting MVP odds, but I think Jameis is are interesting. He's got 50 to one odds. I'm not here to tell you Jameis Winston's the MVP. I'm not here to tell you to even gamble because that's not my responsibility to tell you to gamble. It's a very risky business. However, I looked at this and I was like, I mean, you know, by myself, I wouldn't mind throwing $10 on Jameis. And what's the worst? I mean, I, I don't know if you guys ever seen, I got a bunch of Funko Pops all over my room. So I've wasted $10 on much worse than putting 10 on James Winston. And if he becomes the MVP, all right, I got 500. That's not bad, in my opinion. Alvin Kamara, meanwhile, 66 to one odds. Don't think a running back gets it, but those aren't bad odds at all for a guy who is in the mix for Offensive Player of the Year. And I did find it interesting that those were the two names for the Saints. Kamara, I expected. Winston, I should have expected. I don't know why it kind of drew me by surprise. I was a little thrown off that Michael Thomas's odds weren't in the initial like top 25 to 30 candidates that bet online put out there, but interesting stuff. Nonetheless, I know a lot of people started joking about Winston, but you'll be surprised. I guarantee there's some people who take a flyer on bets like that, where, Hey, put 10 bucks down. If it hits $500 doesn't hit, you lose 10 bucks. I mean, I think a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Now, if you get a large one or grande, whatever the hell they're called, that's probably 10 bucks. So I think people have spent on much worse. So those are the MVP odds there. I find them pretty interesting and we'll see what happens there. Let's go to a guy who's not currently on the saints but maybe he could be on the Saints very soon. Maybe this is not me giving you a scoop. This is just me trying to just read the tea leaves and see what's going on. And that's Quan Alexander, Saints linebacker from last season, torn Achilles, gets cut. We all know the drill. So he's got, in my opinion, still a decent way to go before we see him on the field. But there was a video posted by his physical therapist, who, by the way, does all those cool drills with Alvin Kamara. So if you're not following on Instagram, go follow him. He's got some great stuff there. And he posted a video of Quan Alexander in quotes and, I don't know what this means, but I'm going to just give you the quote anyway of Quan strengthening his calf and Achilles tendon while simulating triple extension position of linear acceleration. Now, I'm not a doctor. That sounds pretty smart, though, if you ask me. And in the video, you see they're obviously putting stress on that back region to see how strong they can build, not just the Achilles, but the area around the Achilles, because that's usually what you do with most injuries. For example, you injure your knee or your ACL per se, they probably want you to strengthen the rest of your knee before you have surgery. And then obviously post-surgery, you'll do the same. So I don't know what's going to happen with Quan Alexander. I can't sit here and tell you Quan's going to be on the Saints, but he's still a free agent. The man was working out with Saints shorts. The Saints still need a linebacker. And as the days go on, I'm more convinced the Saints aren't getting a linebacker at pick 28. So what does that lead me to be, believe? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to, one, bring him back on a one-year contract. Two, grab a linebacker later in the draft, if that's the case. Because with Quan, you're hoping he gives you eight games. If he gives you more than eight games, that's nice. So you're kind of looking for him to usher in a new player. And maybe that gives the younger player who you might take on day two or day three, eight weeks to get into the system. Or maybe, and I don't have much faith in this, but maybe, Zach Bond is starting to develop the way the Saints want him to. Now, that is a big if. 
but the Saints didn't upgrade at linebacker free agency. So that kind of makes me think it's not a handshake deal, but it's a, hey, if Quan's recovering well and we like what we see, what is the worst thing that can happen by bringing him back on a one-year deal? He plays, he gets hurt again. Okay, fine. What it cost you it was a one-year deal. He's not on the books next year. So it is, in my opinion, no risk. And the reward, you know what the reward is because you've seen it up close. Quan needed about a week to learn what the Saints defense was all about and learn how he fits in. And he fit in beautifully. We all saw it. So I want to see what happens there. If they could bring back Quan, I would be all for it. You know, I'm a big fan of not just the player, but the person. I think Quan staying in New Orleans would be a nice story for him. And it also changes the way you draft. And that's why when people get on the Saints case for being interested in a Richard Sherman or being interested in a TJ Carey, and everyone says, well, that's not splashy. The Saints were really great for the last four years, not just because of their star power, because of their depth. And they lost a lot of that depth because of the cap space and the cap going down. So how do you combat that? You bring in a couple of veterans on one-year deals who might be trying to reset their value and, and build off a nice 2021 season. That is a way to do it. And getting Quan back on a one-year deal where it's really a prove-it deal and you just want to see if he can stay healthy, that is a way to do it. Bringing in Richard Sherman, who, by the way, said he's probably not going to get signed until after the draft. What is the harm in that? I'm sorry. What is the harm in Richard Sherman coming to the Saints if it's a one-year deal? There is no harm in that, okay? We've, we've gone through Brandon Browner. We've gone through the Champ Bailey phase. We've gone through a lot as Saints fans. So I don't think those two scenarios I listed for you guys are the worst things in the world. But now that we got that out of the way, we got the MVP odds out of the way, let's get to the fun stuff that I promised, and that's NFL Draft Talk. And let's start off with a guy who I – kind of can't wait to talk about but on this you know on the other side I'm a little nervous because when I talk about him I I don't really know where I stand on Caleb Farley here's what I know he's the best corner in this draft that is that's not even a debate for me now you can throw JC Horn's name out there you can throw Patrick Sertain the second you can throw out Greg Newsom who I love you guys know I love Greg uh, Greg Newsom however if I'm just watching the players and you don't tell me about their injury history I'm just watching them Caleb Farley looks the best. And when I watch Farley, there's a lot to like. For starters, I think his ball skills are really good. I think he's physical. He's got the size. He's impressive. He's a guy who you know you can get a good press corner out of. Those are all elite traits. Those are traits that most of the top corners in the league have. So he fits that bill. What's the worry then? That's what you're all wondering. For those who don't know about Caleb Farley yet. For those that do, you know the worry, and I'm about to get to it. For those that don't, I'm about to get to it right now. He's got two back injuries in his career, torn ACL early in his year, in his career. I'm not worried about the torn ACL. We've reached that point in modern medicine and rehab and, and these athletes. I mean, they tear their, tear their ACL and they might be better the year after. Like we've seen it. We've seen Adrian Peterson do it. Heck, we might see Joe Burrow do it next season. We see guys do it all the time. Deshaun Watson, I know tough name to, to mention right now during these times, but Deshaun had two torn ACLs. So I've seen really good athletes have torn ACLs and bounce back. That doesn't concern me for Caleb. The back injury. Those are the ones that just linger and they don't linger for a month, two months. They linger for years. And this back injury does concern me. I'm not worried that he sat out 2020 because of COVID concerns. I'm not worried that he tore his ACL back then, like three or four years ago. I'm worried about the back injury and does it flare up and does it nag him? And does it get to the point where I don't know if he's going to play? That's the concern. And I tweeted about it and it was almost sarcastic, but I kind of meant it at the same time. Here's where we stand with Caleb Farley. Best case scenario, this kid develops into the all pro cornerback he's capable of being. Worst case scenario, he barely sees the field. The most likely scenario, we are going through a training camp of Sean Payton not telling you where this guy is, what's going on, what his availability is like. It basically be like Jarrus Bird all over again. And I kind of don't want to go through that. But at the same time, I always have to kind of throw that flip side out there. And the flip side is if you're picking at 21, and the board, you know, the options on the board are not what you prefer. You don't really like what's out there. And he's by far going to be the best player available. In terms of value, he will be the best player available if he reaches 28. Now, I don't even know if he's going to reach 28, but let's just play this hypothetical out like he is. Do you take him? My answer is yes, depending on who's there. And I know it's crazy, but he's that good. And I've reached a point in the NFL where I think half of it in terms of drafting, you know what you know? But the unknown element, you're never going to get right. It's always a guess. And what I mean by that is I remember Miles Jack coming out of UCLA was a top 15 prospect. And now Miles Jack, I, I wouldn't say he's been that impressive in the NFL. He's been a serviceable linebacker, very good at times, but he hasn't been amazing per se.
But Miles Jack fell not because of his skill, not because of his attitude. He fell because people said, man, I think Miles Jack, knee, his knees are shot. You know, you look at the medical, they're bad. Okay, well, let's fast forward four or five years later. The man's played in 73 NFL games already. He actually didn't miss a game at all in his first three seasons. You can't predict things sometimes. I know it sounds crazy. There was no concern with Marcus Davenport's health coming out of uh, UTSA. No worry about that man's health. What do we always worry about Marcus Davenport? That he might go stub his toe, turn in the corner out of bed, and he's out for a month. That's what you're worried about. So there's some things you can't predict, and there's some things you can. But in terms of injury history, it's tough. Now, sometimes it plays out the way it looks. For example, Alex Anzalone was always injury prone at Florida. And guess what Alex Anzalone is in the NFL? He's injury prone. He also can't cover, but that's besides the point. But he's injury prone. Caleb Farley is a fantastic player. And when he's healthy, you know what you're going to get in him. But there is that butt that I have to throw in. And no one wants to deal with that. And it's a concern. But I think it comes down to the board. That, that's the way I'm going to put it. I know it's almost like a cop-out in that sense, but if the board's not what the Saints want, take him. He's the best value. He's the best value. At pick 28, you're going to get a guy, in my opinion, who's one of the 10 best prospects in this class and the best in the secondary. You, look, I'm not going to say what do you have to lose because you have a lot to lose, but we've seen the Saints use first-round picks on much worse. Literally, their last two first-round picks they've used, much worse. Not trying to knock Ruiz and knock Davenport, but let's just let's play a fair, guys. They've done much worse with their first round pick than take the best corner in the draft, who, albeit, has injury issues. So I'm very curious to see where you guys stand on Caleb Farley. I'm going to be as passionate as I can be about this subject in particular moving forward because the kid's that good. Go watch his 2019 tape. He is that good. I promise you, you'll watch him and you'll be amazed. I listed my two favorite prospects to watch. It was Jeremiah Wusu kormoa from Notre Dame and Jalen Waddle from Alabama. Those are the two favorites. I just, I just love watching those guys. Plug in the tape. It's a joy. Farley's in there. I just didn't mention Farley because I knew you guys were going to just go off. That's why I listed it to two. I didn't need a debate on Twitter about Caleb Farley. I know Caleb Farley is great. And I see it with my eyes. Don't know what it's going to turn into. But I really hope if it comes down to this and he's on the Saints, I, I will be cautiously optimistic. That's, what, that's who I am by nature, first off. And second, the kid's great. Just go watch the tape and you'll see it out. So we're not done yet with Straight Up Saints this time around. Now, next week, I do have a special guest on for that one. It's one of your favorite Saints reporters. So stay tuned for that one. We're going to have some good talk about the NFL draft, what the Saints might be looking for, and things of that nature. So you will enjoy that one. So stay tuned for that one. Going to have one of your favorites on for that. Before I wrap it up, though, I'm not ready to. I, I tweeted out that I was going to take a couple of prospect suggestions and we'll talk about it and we'll go through them. So without further ado, I believe we have, let me just count for you guys. We got about, I believe six or seven prospects that you guys suggested or heavily suggested. I took the first, I said I was going to take the first five. I took the first seven and let's go for it. So let's start off with the first one. And I'm going to surprise you because I'm actually going to do two quarterbacks here in terms of analyzing. Kellen Mond from Texas A&M. That's the first one we're going to go with. Before I go into pros and cons, Kellen Mond, for me, is such a fascinating player because at a and he did start all four years. You thought he would get better. I never saw a crazy progression. I never saw him regress at the same time. So I guess that's a, that's a pro, but he's a day three guy for me. And I, I don't think you draft Kellen Mond with the intention of thinking he is going to absolutely be a franchise quarterback. I think you draft Kellen Mond thinking he could end up being a very good system fit. That's important. Now, I know you say that for every NFL quarterback, but Kellen Mond specifically for me, if you draft him, you like the pieces around you, you think he fits in well, so you go for it. And that's what I would say. But here's my pros for Kellen Mond. Like I mentioned before, four-year starter. I like that. I like that his eyes are always downfield, especially in his senior season watching him. It almost hurt him at times because he could have ran because he does have the dual threat capabilities, which I consider a pro. But he likes to keep his eyes downfield because he wants to see how can I move the ball with my arm. And then if he has to take off, he'll take off. So I do like that. I think his form is very consistent. I'm not necessarily a huge fan of his form, but you notice tendencies with quarterbacks, especially these college kids. A lot of them just change their form on the fly. Maybe they're not comfortable with it. Maybe they saw something new. I can't explain what they do with some of these things. But in terms of Kellen Mond, it's the same form, the same way he sets. I think he's consistent in that regard, and I think that's important. And then another thing, and you saw that his senior year, his deep ball accuracy, I should say, or touch, it was improving. Now, it still leaves a lot to be desired, but it was improving, and that's what you want to see with these guys. I think the important thing when you're looking at quarterbacks 
especially college kids. You got to watch them and you got to think with how are they going to progress? Cause they're not who they are right now. That, that is one of the weirdest things. And I don't, I don't like Mel Kuyper in terms of analysis. I don't think he's the best out there. I know he's made a hell of a career. So props to him. But the one thing he said, well, when he was talking about Justin Fields, he said, you got to scout with progression and you got to scout with a uh, trajectory or trajectory. And you got to basically scout with anticipation. So you got to scout with anticipation on prospects and Kellen Mond today is not who he's going to be four years from now. That doesn't mean he's going to be a superstar, but he's not the same prospect. So you got to think, what is this guy a couple of years from now? As for the cons for Kellen Mond, he does have a couple of flat throws. Like hey, there's just no zip on that thing. Sometimes he's a little stiff for my liking. It, it, you know, when you watch these prospects at their pro day, they like to throw that final pass. It just wows you. I mean, Zach Wilson did it. Justin Fields did it. Trevor Lawrence did it. Mon did it, and it was a hell of a throw. Don't get me wrong. His body just looked stiff. Like, he just wasn't comfortable. It was, it was kind of odd, but that was a problem for me. He's not that explosive in terms of the passing game. You're not going to get the big play all the time. And the inconsistency. I saw him light up South Carolina, just light them up. Next week, he does nothing against LSU. It's just weird for me. And this was not the year to struggle against LSU's defense. Not the year at all. So a little inconsistent for my liking. He's a day three guy. I don't hate Kelamon at all. I don't necessarily love him, but he he's going to be an interesting prospect. And with the right coaching staff, you never know. Maybe you can get an Alex Smith out of him with the right coaching staff. The next guy on my list that I wanted to study, you guys didn't suggest this. ESPN gave me the inspiration and I decided I'm going to do it because I know I'll ruffle some feathers. Let's talk about Davis Mills from Stanford. Oh, baby, this is an interesting one. And the reason Mills is interesting is because people are saying, oh, you might fall, you might go into the first round. I never in a million years would have thought he would. I still don't know if he will, but I'm not going to definitively say that he's not because Davis Mills fits the, the mold of these quarterbacks that have been going first round. Big arm, can move, a lot of zip on his passes. These are all pros, by the way. He's got mobility, attacks the seams. Everything you want in a quarterback, this man's got. But here's the problem with Davis Mills. I haven't seen it consistently. I haven't seen the production the experience is in there. We love to say Trey Lance doesn't have any experience. If he doesn't have any experience, I need to know what Davis Mills has. I need to. Because the, the experience is not there. The production's not there. But more importantly, he's actually aggressive to a fault. He attacks it seems a little bit too much sometimes. And I, I think that leaves me in a situation where I'm like, okay, right coaching staff can fix him. Wrong coaching staff, this guy's going to be a turnover machine. So I, I find it curious. I, I kind of worry in a sense that I think if this kid landed with the Buccaneers, he could be an interesting fit. Now, I know you're going to say, well, Chris, you said if someone's too aggressive and we saw with Jameis and Bruce Arians, I get that, totally get that. But this kid would have the luxury of sitting behind Tom Brady. I would assume that's going to help him. Just a thought. And that's the advantage of if someone trades into the first round and gets Davis Mills, you get that fifth year of security. And that fifth year means a lot for teams. And I'm not advocating for Davis Mills to go first round. I'm also not advocating for the Saints to take him first round. If they do, I think that'd be really weird. Sean Payton better be on his A game with this kid. But the ball does jump out of his hands. And when you watch him, you can see why scouts might fall in love with him. I absolutely see why. I mean, in some regard, he kind of looked like Carson Wentz out of North Dakota State. Not as good, obviously. Not as productive. But in some regard, I see it. So I understand why people like him. However, still, I, I'm going to say no. I don't think the Saints can get him. But it was a fascinating guy. Now, the next guy, someone suggested this one. It's Tommy Tremble from Notre Dame. He actually met with the Saints earlier this year. Uh, I, I don't know where that led to. And Tommy's an interesting guy. And the reason I say that is he's more of a blocker, really great blocker in that regard. Super athletic, has all the measurables you want, can get downfield. He showed that he can get off the line pretty quick. But the problem with Tommy is he's raw in that, you know, that receiving game. I don't think he necessarily runs his routes particularly well. He's not that much of a red zone threat. He only had four career touchdowns. And you also didn't get a team shine at Notre Dame. Some of that is he wasn't polished enough. And some of that is you play on a Notre Dame team that every year it's, it's a good tight end. I mean, one year it's Cole Komet. One year it's, it's, I mean, every year Notre Dame just pumps out these tight ends. It's insane. So I like Tommy Tremble as a, a guy who in the middle rounds could be another tight end for you. But I think if you're the Saints, I think there's options out there where if you want a blocking tight end, Okay, cool. I think there's guys in the undrafted market, like maybe a Jack Stoll from Nebraska, who could actually pay off and be a really good blocker. If you want a more of a receiving type of guy, well, Kerry Angeline from NC State, maybe that's your guy who can receive. He had over 900 receiving yards at NC State. So I think there's better options than Tommy Tremble. 
if you're going for one specific thing. Now, if you're going for a blocker with high upside, athletically speaking, Tommy Tremble's your guy. And that's why the Saints have met with him. He fits their mold for tight end. So I totally see what, what the, the interest is between the two sides. I'm not sure what's going to go down with that, though. But I think it is fascinating. He's not a bad prospect at all. There's a lot left to be desired. And the reason the Saints are interested in tight ends, obviously, is because you want to take more off of Adam Troutman's plate. On the other hand, though, you did sign Nick Vanette, and Nick Vanette is a very good blocking tight end. So I think if you're the Saints, in my opinion, if I'm looking for another tight end, I'm looking for a guy who can offer me a little bit more in the receiving game. And that's why I'm not all in on Tommy Trimble. I would be totally okay with them taking Tommy, but I'm not going to be sitting here banging on the table telling you they better draft Tommy Trimble. This is not what I'm going to do. Some guy who I can not maybe bang on the table and jump on the table and just go nuts over and say they should draft him, but someone who's very fascinating and you guys uh, suggested, Ufatu Melamfanu from Syracuse. First off, the athleticism, the frame, the size, that's what you want in a DB. He's got long arms. He's active in terms of making pass breakups. He's a willing tackler. His form's good too. It's that wrap up and roll form that you want. Now, I don't know if his instincts are up to par yet. I don't know if his change of direction speed is going to be what you want from a corner, but I think Melamfanu, a day two pick is pretty solid, but I think for me, I still rank him behind your Asante Samuels, your Greg Newsoms, even your Aaron Robinsons from UCF. I would still rank him behind them, but I see why people like him. I mean, he's a 6'3 corner with long arms, a lot of pass breakups at Syracuse, active hands. There's a reason I like him. Fun fact for you guys, actually, Syracuse alone, they got three DBs who are going to get drafted this year. So tip your cap to the orange. I know we're used to them for playing basketball, but I mean, their football program in terms of developing talent, they're doing a good job, especially on the defensive side of the ball. So Mullen Fonwu was a really good suggestion. I liked his tape more than I, than I disliked it. I think if he gets drafted by the Saints, it would indicate that day one pick was not a corner, obviously. But you can't fault taking him. And I actually think with Mel Fonwu, if you did draft him, I would love to see this kid getting coached up by Chris Richard and also mentored by Rich Sherman. I think that would be fascinating. Because he does have some tendencies in being that big guy who's active with his hands, which is what Sherman made a living off of with the Seattle Seahawks. So really fascinating prospect. I'm sure you guys will enjoy him if you watch. We got two more. These are both suggested, both wide receivers. I actually talked about both of them previously, not in depth. So I'll go a little bit in depth here. Elijah Moore from Ole Miss and Jonathan Adams from Arkansas State. So Elijah Moore, I know this man, people might think of the, the, celebration taunt he had against Mississippi State. Throw that out the window. First off, he apologized a million times. Second, he has improved both as a player and as a person, he said. And I, I see, I witnessed it as a college football fan this past year, just watching him and listening to what he had to say. Elijah Moore is one of my favorite prospects in this draft. I'm not going to beat around the bush here. I'm going to say it the way he is. I think he's got good speed, great downfield playing uh, playmaking ability, and more importantly, where you like all that stuff with Rondell Moore from Purdue, Elijah Moore's at least two inches taller. And I think that does matter because I I tell everyone, I know you want to think that size doesn't matter on the football field, but it does in terms of, can you make this catch in traffic? What is your catch radius? Can you go up and get that ball? That all matters guys. It all matters. So Elijah Moore being around five, nine, five, 10, that definitely helps him more than it hurts him where Moore's more on the, the the Boilermakers is five, seven. Though things that I don't like about Elijah Moore Obviously, like I said before, his catch radius is just not huge. I think that's something that you want to see. I don't know if he can prove that catch radius really isn't something you get better at, but maybe making yourself a little bit more available. And I just think that if you're going to have size concerns, all right, then he's not your guy. But I think with the Saints, we've seen them make it work with guys that are 5'10". So I wouldn't be surprised if they could do it with Elijah Moore. However, I've noticed something. The Saints are looking at Josh Matter, baby. They're looking at bigger receivers. So if the Saints are in on these 6'2", 6'3", guys, Elijah Moore is going to slip out the window because he's just not that type of dude, but you plug in the tape and he got better year to year. Looked really good. Learned different offenses too. Had Lane Kiffin's offense this year. I think there's a lot to like about Elijah Moore. So if you want to receive day two, because I know people are pushing for day one, but I think we need to be careful with who we push day one. When it comes to receivers, the only ones I'm definitely taking day one, Jamar Chase, who the best receiver in the draft. I'm not taking another answer for that. Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, who you guys know I love, Kadarius Toney, Rashad Bateman, and Terrace Marshall. Those are the guys for me that should go first round. Rondell Moore, I could see him going first round. Even Elijah Moore, who I don't think should go first round, I could see him going first round. But those aren't the guys I'm going to sit here and say they should 
definitely go first round. And there's a difference to that. So the ones I mentioned are the guys that I think are obviously heads and shoulders above the rest of the field. How about Jonathan Adams? What a fascinating dude. I'll tell you how I learned about Jonathan Adams. I'm sitting here working. It's a regular Saturday. I'm watching the Kansas State game. And, and the only reason I was watching Kansas State, because Kansas State's not a football powerhouse, obviously. They were only big game on at noon. It was on Fox. And they're playing Arkansas State. Should be a win for Kansas State. And Arkansas State pulls out the upset. And this one receiver, number nine, Jonathan Adams, is sitting here making play after play after play after play. And you got to the point where you're like, okay, what the hell are the Wildcats doing in terms of Kansas State Wildcats? It should be, we're not covering them at all. I mean, it was a jump ball after jump ball after jump ball. And the one thing that impressed me the most was he was using his size. He was using his ability in the red zone to box out a receiver, almost like basketball, box out the corner, excuse me, and make that play, make that touchdown. So I think the, the size for Adams is there. The red zone capabilities are there. The jump ball contested catch part is good. Not as great as you'd want to be, but it's good. Here was what I also noticed in that game with Adams, though. And I think it's something that needs, it's a habit that needs to be broken. This man, I mean, every time the ball gets thrown up to up in the air, he's throwing up one hand. He's like sitting here trying to get the next Odell catch. And I just think that that's a bad habit that needs to break. It's not something that would keep me from drafting the guy if I love him. I mean, that's more nitpicking than anything else. But I noticed that. And I, and I thought I was crazy. And I searched it up. I'm like, what are people saying about them? And someone said, it. you know, sometimes he throws one hand out instead of two. And I'm like, I don't see Michael Thomas sitting there throwing two hands, uh, one hand out. That man's always going two hands, sure thing. So I like Jonathan Adams, day three guy, later in the draft. If you want a big body red zone threat, I mean, this is a dude. I do not know where he fits on the Saints, so I don't know if that's what they want. Now, if the Saints get him, red zone, man, this is where he's going to be effective. But I'm not sure. Not a lot of burst after the catch. That's probably a, a, the biggest negative, I would say. But that one hand thing, man, that, that's got to stop because – that's not going to fly in the NFL. I can tell you that much, but Jonathan Adams, really interesting one. And I appreciate everyone who sent me suggestions. If I didn't get to yours, I really, I really apologize. I know someone sent me Davis from Kentucky. I already analyzed him earlier. So that's why I didn't get to him. I already said, I didn't really like his tape. doesn't mean I don't hate the guy, but his tape wasn't that impressive compared to other linebackers, but I really appreciate all the suggestions you guys had. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And again, stay tuned for next week's episode of straight up saints here going to have one of your favorite Saints reporters on. We're going to talk NFL draft, all that good stuff. We'll go round one through seven, kind of who they should target for each round. Maybe some free agency news. If some arise by then, then we'll talk about it, of course, and kind of what to expect with this team. Because, you know, with this guy, he's always working. So I'm really excited to talk to him next week. But that's going to do it for this edition of Straight Up Saints, which is presented by Boot Crew Media and Level Water. I want to thank you guys for listening. Stay tuned for more content in the future. And again, Enjoy the rest of your week. The draft is almost coming up. It's three weeks away by the time you listen to this episode. And I'm sorry, two weeks away. I'm losing track of time here. Two weeks away by the time you listen to this episode. So I'm really excited to get into that. So again, enjoy the rest of your week, guys, and stay tuned for another edition of the Straight Up Saints podcast coming next week.